relevant um, contusion injury, the most common injury, to level C4, cervical spinal cord. We could bypass this with an electronic circuit, essentially hot wiring the nervous system, bridging this link, and restoring the ability to move the hands and arms. Even just a simple reach and grasp would dramatically improve the quality of life for patients who were otherwise paralyzed from the neck down. Another intriguing possibility is that operation of this circuit, and we have some evidence for this which I'll show you, operation of this circuit could actually potentially help to improve connectivity of any remaining neurons in the circuit. So it could increase synaptic strength, the mechanisms of LTP perhaps, and plasticity. Actually promoting neurons that artificially, in this case, fire together, we're hoping that they may naturally wire together. So of course, such an ambitious project has, has challenges in uh, securing traditional funding. We've listed just three ideas here. We've heard several of these before, but uh, I think in our case especially, success on a, on a project like this really requires collaboration, multidisciplinary collaboration between neuroscientists and computational um, biologists, computational neuroscientists, and, and uh, those that can build these engineered devices like Josh. And so uh, a traditional study section really can't evaluate such a broad, a broad skill set. It's also fairly ambitious work. In, 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 in undertaking this work, we are uh, looking at several paradigm shifting um, implementations. So stimulating the spinal cord rather than the muscles. And I'll tell you why we're doing that. But that certainly goes against the status quo of, of the field. Different measures of, and mechanisms of decoding that Adrian Fairhall is working on. Um, really quite a different approach um, to reading this activity out of the brain, interpreting this, that's been used uh, more commonly in the brain-computer interface field. And then finally, Josh will tell you more about this, really the scale of the engineering effort, wireless um, communication, wireless power. Uh, this is a batteryless device uh, that we're trying to realize. And onboard efficient computing that can actually convert the intention to move to uh, actual movements in real time. Uh, dissipating small enough amounts of heat that it doesn't cause damage to the tissue around where it's implanted. So all these things really uh, come together um, to, uh, to make the funding for the foundation critical to move this forward. So I've told you several times that it's ambitious. Uh, what makes us think we can be successful? Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background from the work in my lab. Josh will tell you about some of his work. Uh, but really, the concepts here are starting to come together. Many of the pieces are now being demonstrated in human clinical trial. So for about the last 13 years, people have been working on recording activity from the brain and transducing that into movements of computer cursors or more recently robotic arms in real time. And there's now a multi-site clinical trial that's uh, moving to 15 different sites. This is the BlackRock trial. So John Donahue, Lee Hochberg at Brown really started this. It's a group at Pittsburgh working independently. Uh, but now there are many sites where patients with high-level spinal cord injury or brainstem stroke can sign up to be implanted with these devices in the brain to read out their intention to move. And there's certainly many challenges remaining in this field, um, but at least some of, this, uh, some of these issues have been solved and it's now moving to trial. Um, there's also been many years of work stimulating the muscles, stimulating the paralyzed muscles, known as functional electrical stimulation. There are clinical devices that have been deployed. There are problems with this in terms of fatigue, and I'll tell you how we're planning to address some of those. But I want to first just briefly tell you about a study where we did essentially what's diagrammed in this image. We use many fewer muscles, uh, but we recorded the intention to move from the brain in a non-human primate, in a monkey model of reversible uh, peripheral nerve paralysis. And in real time, we controlled stimulation of the muscles of the wrist, so this animal could learn to reanimate, in this case, one degree of freedom movement of the wrist. And the animation shown here summarizes how we did the experiment. We began by training the animal to control the activity of the brain, essentially in operant conditioning or brain-computer interface paradigm where we displayed um, the movement of, or the uh, movement of a cursor was proportional to neural activity. Then we used either uh, a miniature electronic device or a more standard computer to convert in real time the activity of one or more neurons into proportional stimulation of a muscle and challenged the monkey to move his otherwise paralyzed wrist using this circuit and drive cursors into targets. So, so this, is, this is a temporarily yes. paralyzed arm? So yes. Okay. Yeah. So peripheral nerve block was the model we used here. And great question, because in order to test um, brain control of spinal stimulation, which is where we want to go next, it's much more difficult to do a reversible paralysis. And so for that reason, we've moved to a rodent model. And the rodent model also, of course, lets us um, 
test many more animals to look at this concept of neuroplasticity and actually more rigorously quantify connectivity in these spare, in these spare circuits. And it also allows us to do the most clinically relevant injury uh, for this model, which is a contusion injury, mid-cervical contusion injury. So this is just an example of some preliminary data showing that, of course, we can still identify neurons in the brain, I'm calling them units here, we're not sure it's an isolated neuron. Uh, we can identify single units which respond uh, in here, in this case, slightly before, and then during the pressing of a lever. So the task we're interested in is a reach and grasp task with the forelimb for these animals. And so in the simplest case, we can find single cells, single neurons that fire reliably uh, as the animal reaches uh, for these levers. Now, in tight collaboration with Adrian Fairhall, it'll be our goal to evaluate, is it single units that are the best control signal? Is it local field potentials? Is it some combination of those? And is it more direct connections between the brain and the spinal cord, essentially letting the brain do the learning and the adaptation? Or would we benefit from principal component analysis, um, late structures analysis? Are there, other, are there other algorithms that we could use to confer? Critically, we want to make sure we are allowing the brain to learn and adapt to this circuit and not uh, inhibiting that process with too restrictive an algorithm. I think some of that is what's currently going on in the BCI field. So I told you there were problems with muscle stimulation. Why are we so interested in stimulating within the spinal cord? The spinal cord has its own circuitry for movement. The cervical enlargement, the lumbar enlargement contain things like central pattern generators contain very complex sensory motor integration circuitry which we can tap into with our stimulating electrodes. And so this field really started with Vivian Mouchoir and several others um, over 10, 15 years ago now uh, where they demonstrated in the lumbar spinal cord that they were able to not only evoke more natural movements, more fatigue resistant movements, um, movements that had more smoothly graded force. A, ch a challenge with stimulating the muscle is that you recruit motor units in the inverse order. So you get the largest, fastest, most fatigable motor units first. That results in a huge force right off the bat and very rapid fatigue. Such that someone who's receiving functional electrical stimulation of their leg muscles might only be able to walk 100 meters before they're completely fatigued. Vivian Mushar showed very nicely in her model, in her cat model, that stimulating intraspinally, her cats could walk over a kilometer with very little signs of fatigue. There was very little evidence that this stimulation was causing fatigue, and that's partly due to the natural recruitment order, or more natural recruitment order of these motor units. It's also partly due to the fact that she can stimulate functional synergies with very few electrodes. Uh, some of the studies that Vivian's done actually only have two electrodes per leg. One electrode uh, positioned correctly can activate all the extensor muscles in the leg to support body weight hip extensors, knee extensors, ankle extensors. Another electrode tapping into a reflex circuit can cause the leg to retract. You think of it as a flexor withdrawal reflex. So essentially two electrodes per leg can cause fairly coordinated stepping movements. There's no balance in this case. The, the balance is taken care of externally. But we like this approach because it could dramatically simplify the control signals needed from the brain. If we can find a spinal site that causes reaching, shoulder, elbow, and wrist, we can find another spinal site that causes grasping. We no longer have to implant 8, 10, 12 different electrodes and coordinate that stimulation and pattern to get a functional reach and grasp. And so that's the reason that we've focused on spinal stimulation. We've done some work in the non-human primate. We've done some work in the rodent. I'll show you our rodent work here. This is more recent. And this, these are stimulations in the cervical spinal cord um, between C7, or excuse me, uh, C3 actually in this study down to, to the first thoracic site thoracic segment, T1. And what I want to show you here is one of the more common movements we get. It's extension of the elbow. You're looking at the, the rat's forepaw there. And here we're using three different intensities of stimulation. So you should be able to see a grading of force. A, first a small uh, intensity of stimulation, a medium, and then a large intensity in this particular video. And this type of movement could be evoked from all the sites labeled in green in the figure underneath when we do a mapping exercise when we, when we explore the cervical spinal cord. This movement here, flexion of the wrist in this case, perhaps a slight flexion of the digits as well, evoked from these sites shown in yellow from the figure below. So you can imagine putting these two together to get a reaching movement, a grasping movement, it's very, in its very simplest case. There are many more movements than just this. We've actually performed a mapping experiment in a spinally intact group of animals uh, where we identify here we show at least 12, uh, 12 most common movements uh, indicated by each individual color. And you see nice clustering shoulder movements up near the higher cervical segments as you might expect based on the somatotopy of the spinal cord. 
wrist and digit movements um, near the more distal areas. But a critical question to us is would these movements persist after spinal cord injury? We know the spinal cord reorganizes to some extent after injury. Certainly it changes its excitability. And so we performed a study where we performed these contusions and injuries and then remapped at fixed time points after injury. And at three weeks after injury, we were mortified to see that all, almost all movements from the spinal cord had, had uh, devolved to this pure extensor movement, sort of the opposite of the spasticity that you see developing in these animals. But we continued to test at six and then nine weeks after injury, and we see this variety begin to come back. And certainly by nine weeks, at least, there's no statistical difference between an animal um, is recovered for six or nine weeks and those that are intact. There are some trends here, slightly fewer distal than proximal movements, partly due to the cavitation of the injury. The injury is right here on the dorsal C4, C5 segment. You can see an absence of movements in the cavity of the injury, as you would expect, but still able to evoke a wide variety of movements and from similar locations as prior to injury. So these data give us some confidence that we're able to evoke the repertoire of movements that we would need, in, at least for simple reanimation. I want to spend just my last two slides talking about a study that we performed to try to look at enhancing plasticity or enhancing recovery based on the stimulation alone. So in this study, we stimulated the spinal cord below a C4 um, contusion injury. This was a lateralized contusion injury, so it damages one half of the spinal cord, spares some pathways on the other half. So animals are still able to, have to move with some residual function. And in this study, we performed what I'm going to call open loop stimulation or therapeutic stimulation. We stimulate the spinal cord but with no correlation to brain activity. Really trying to see what kind of benefits could we evoke if we just therapeutically activate the spinal cord. So we injure, we wait four weeks, we begin stimulation, we stimulate seven hours a day for 12 weeks, then we test the animals, of course, weekly. I'll show you the data uh, over time here. The animals that are stimulated do better than the animals who are unstimulated. It's nowhere near a complete recovery, but it is a marked difference. And the key here is that all these data were collected with the stimulator inactive. So this isn't a prosthetic effect. This isn't the stimulator causing them to move. This is stimulation all day long, turn the stimulator off, test the end. It's some sort of persistent effect. And this video, I think, illustrates the difference between the two animals. First animal you'll see was never stimulated, other than very brief pulses to confirm the electrodes were implanted. The animal's goal is to reach this food pellet here sitting on the white block. And their food pellet is to keep this particular animal interested. Because you can see that she's not able to reach through a slit in the plexiglass arena. She has flexor spasticity. This is a stimulated animal. Again, stimulators turned off. Animal's able to extend, retrieve the food pellet, bring it back into the cage. Stumbles a little bit on the return. It's, it's not a perfect recovery, but able to acquire the food pellet and eat it without dropping it on the floor. So some evidence there that there's a sustained benefit of this type of stimulating circuit being active. And so we're eager to explore how connecting correlated activity from the brain with these spinal sites could perhaps invoke spike timing dependent plasticity in this spared circuit. But now Josh is going to tell us about uh, how we're going to realize the implanted device because without, um, without a completely implanted device, the risks of infection are just too great for this type of implant. Okay, well thank you. And as you, as you probably realize, this project has just been put together, so um, you know, it's, we haven't even really started. So essentially this is about what are the pieces that are kind of leading into the project. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work in the last few years on uh, wireless power, and one of the reasons that that is possible is, is probably of interest to, to, uh, to, to this group. So this plot, if you don't look very carefully, looks a lot like the Moore's Law plot that we saw a few minutes ago. Um, horizontal axis is decades, but the vertical axis, instead of number of transistors, is actually instructions per microjoule. So what this is showing is that the energy efficiency of our engineered electronic computers has been improving exponentially. So from uh, ENIAC in 1940 to a recent Dell laptop, uh, the improvement was a factor of 10 to the 12th, a trillion, which is a lot. And that really changes what we can do. Where does um, an iPhone fit in on that? Uh, it's it's probably so close to close. There were a lot of energy efficiencies in mobile computing. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, I haven't updated that. It's probably close to the Dell laptop, obviously. But you can see the brain is on there, and that's another you know factor of a million uh, better than than where we are today. Probably because it's going slowly but in parallel. 
And you know, if you, if you keep going, you know, DNA computing is probably up here. And actually, there's no upper limit, which is kind of exciting, fundamentally. Um, but so that's one of the things we're making use of. Um, so I'll just show you a couple of examples of that. Uh, so the first one is called WISP, which stands for Wireless Identification and Sensing Platform. And the little movie I'm going to play here shows uh, an, whoops, an accelerometer um, that is uh, being powered by uh, this little picture frame-like thing is an RFID reader. So it's emitting 900 megahertz radio waves, and it's being used to power a microcontroller accelerometer uh, system, which is communicating back by reflecting the incoming radio waves. So that's a very low power way of doing communication. I'm actually working in the remote. This was many years ago, uh, which is why I'm looking so kind of <coughs> strange there. Um, so as I tilt this back and forth, uh, it's reading the accelerometer values, uh, reflecting the radio waves, doing some computation. It's computing a CRC uh, and, and actually banging the transistor that's reflecting those signals. So you can think of that as a sensor or an input device that's completely wirelessly powered. So there's no battery uh, anywhere in that thing. Um, recently, we did something where we built an EEG uh, that, that's wirelessly powered in this way. So that's what you see my student Artem at the bottom uh, wearing. Uh, and you can see we can distinguish eyes closed from eyes open just to sort of show that the EEG is working. Now that system is still not really usable because uh, it takes a long time to collect the data and the sensing, communication, and, and, and uh, power kind of interfere with one another. So we have to sense for a little while, then do communication and, and power transfer. So one of the things we'd like to do is uh, create a system where that runs uh, continuously. But that's just a kind of early example of the kinds of things we, we're starting to be able to do with, with wirelessly powered uh, systems. Now I'm going to jump ahead to a system that's more similar to what we're going to be using in this project. So rather than far field uh, propagating radio waves, we're going to use uh, near field, uh, which means magnetic uh, <coughs> fields that, that don't propagate uh, very far, but allow us to deliver much larger uh, amounts of power. Um, now, <coughs> may have cut my slides down a little bit too much here, but um, <coughs> this sort of V-shaped plateau that you see uh, is, is going to be kind of the interesting thing about our high power wireless power system. So our high power wireless power system consists of two resonators, uh, two tuned circuits, and um, what you have at the, the left axis here is distance, <coughs> vertical is efficiency, and the horizontal axis here is frequency. So if I have two tuned circuits, like if you want a mechanical analogy, let's say I have a mass in a spring, a second mass in a spring, and they're coupled with another spring. Um, that system actually has two normal modes, or two resonant frequencies, one of which the masses are moving together, the other of which they're moving antiphase. Um, and as you, as you change the tightness of that central spring, the splitting or the difference in resonant frequency between those two modes changes. And that's exactly what you're seeing in this plot. Um, so on one of these branches here, you have the coil currents going the same direction, and the other branches are going opposite directions. But from a practical wireless power point of view, what that means is that if we can adjust the frequency, let's say, so that as the transmit receive distance changes, then the efficiency stays relatively constant. And that's a little different than most people's uh, intuition about wireless power. Usually you think, well, the further away the receiver is, the less power there's going to be. This shows that uh, we can actually keep the power relatively constant. So I'll show you that now. In the first section of this video, um, we, we don't have the auto tuning mechanism turned on. And you'll see that the light bulb is on sometimes and off sometimes, depending on where it is. Then when we enable the auto tuning, uh, the light bulb basically stays on all the time. And in terms of that previous V-shaped plateau, that means we're staying on top of that plateau. So <clears throat> there's uh, the transmit side has a coil, which is a tuned circuit. The receive side is another coil. And the magnetic flux in between is kind of the spring that couples them together. Okay, so you can see that you know, it's on now. When it gets too close, it turns off, and that's because uh, of that, that splitting uh, issue. Um, <clears throat> and in a moment, we're gonna, we're gonna tune on, turn on the auto-tuning, and now auto-tuning's on, and you'll see that the light bulb basically stays on most of the time. And so this is uh, the method that uh, we're 
going to be using uh, in, in this project. Another interesting trick you can do is uh, multi-hop. So if you put another uh, resonator in between these two that are out of range, now the power can actually hop uh, all the way across. And th that could be useful in practice too. Uh, I'll talk about some examples of how you might use that. You can also use it to kind of turn the corner with the, with the power. Um, okay, so one of the applications, biomedical applications we have been working on is with uh, my collaborator Pramod Bondi at Yale School of Medicine. We're trying to power implanted heart pumps called LVADs. Uh, these consume something like 20 watts, so there's no hope of using a battery. And today there's a cord that comes out the abdomen, uh, so we'd like to get rid of that cord to eliminate infection. Um, we've built a you know complete system. We've implanted it in two pigs so far. Eventually, what we'd like to do is have a system where uh, you wear uh, a vest that transmits the power when you're going outdoors, but around the house, let's say in your bed or in a special chair, you'd have a, a transmitter uh, that would enable you not to have to wear uh, a vest at all. Um, so this is one of the things that's been feeding into this project. Um, at the Neural Engineering Center at, uh, at UW, we've been working on trying to create a fully implanted ECOG system, um, and that, uh, that is also going to use this, this wireless power technique. Um, this is in collaboration with Brian Otis as well. Uh, we've designed a first uh, chip uh, uh, that does many of the pieces that we'll need for this project, uh, for the ECOG project. And then with Chet and Adrian, we're now looking at um, the fully implanted electronics for uh, the brain-computer spinal uh, system. Now one of the things we're doing here that uh, we haven't done before is we're actually trying to put a fully programmable microcontroller in the electronics. So we'll have a single chip that has the microcontroller, all the power uh, and communication circuitry, and we can implant that uh, in, in the animal. Um, and what that will let us do is actually run Adrian's algorithms you know, on this uh, system locally, which obviously long term is, is what you want. You can't really have a rack of electronics uh, to drive this. And the scale of that engineering effort is something that would be kind of hard uh, uh, to do with NSF funding or NIH funding, because you'd have to bite off smaller pieces than what we're trying to do here. So, uh, <clears throat> in terms of moving the needle, uh, you know, we're trying to build a programmable, wirelessly powered BCSI system to reanimate limbs following spinal injury. And I'm going to let Chet uh, talk about the last uh, couple points. Sure. And so, so another part of moving the needle is to is to really try to optimize these methods for extracting the intention to move. If we really want to do the processing on an implantable chip, it's going to have to be a very efficient algorithms. We're going to have to leverage the ability of the brain to learn and collaborate uh, with these algorithms. And just as a side note, when we demonstrated that muscle stimulation was possible, we put the simplest transform between the spiking rate of the neural activity and the stimulation. We really let the animal, in this case, learn to adapt to that rather than trying to over-engineer it uh, in the hardware. So the question is, how much, uh, how much algorithm do we need and how much direct connection can we make? Uh, and then the final uh, area where we're pushing the needle is really learning how we can leverage these intraspinal circuits. Can we let the circuitry of the spinal cord solve some of these complex sensory motor integration problems for us? And can we influence the recovery of those innate spinal circuits with the operation of our, of our device? So of course this is a massive effort that includes uh, large teams of people in each one of our labs. We won't go take the time to name them. Of course, um, very thankful for the funding from the foundation. Uh, pieces of the effort, background pieces of the effort were um, supported by uh, some of these other groups. So thank you for your attention. We'll be happy to take any questions.